Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you for joining us. We are here to talk about all things in the garden and in the landscape, anything to do with outside things, even if it's hot, we're gonna talk about that. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture, but not in the summer, at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. And so I'll talk about cut flowers and perennials, but we have three talented folks here to my left, and we're gonna find out their expertise and a little bit about what they like chatting about the most in the landscape. Let's go first to you, Chuck Voigt. Hi, Diane. Chuck Voigt, I'm a uh, <clears throat> retired person in the Crop Sciences Department. Uh, my specialties were vegetables and herbs, uh, but you know, I have a good undergraduate education in horticulture, so we'll try to do lots of things. Um, tonight I'm gonna talk about fall gardening kinds of things. Yes. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I started my uh, cabbage family uh, things for the fall. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to think about it if you're in the heat of summer, but it's a perfect time in June to start your Brussels sprouts particularly because then they will go into the garden July. You kind of nurture them through the rest of the hot part of the summer and then by September they're starting to make sprouts. They're nice and tight. They're less bitter and nasty and um, uh, actually edible probably in October and November. Uh, and, and the same sort of thing with cauliflower, uh, broccoli, and cabbage. Uh, all of those kinds of things uh, naturally uh, would come up, grow over winter, and then biennially they would flower the second year. So that cool fall weather is what they evolved to, 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 to be, be working with. Some other things that you might want to do in your fall garden, some of the shorter season things like radishes and lettuce and, and spinach and some of those kinds of things, those can wait quite a while because uh, all three of those you can start to eat probably 30 to 40 days after you put the seeds in. So um, if you absolutely must have radishes or, or, or lettuce during the hot part of the summer, uh, use a long radish because they, they get rooted in a little better and, and survive it better. Uh, something like a French breakfast or maybe a white icicle. Um, and uh, just uh, look at it that way. Lettuce, if you're going to put lettuce in in that season, uh, it's probably a good time to put it in the shade of something taller. Like if you have five foot tomato cages, mm -hmm. put the lettuce down in the shade of those if you must try to grow your own lettuce. Also, uh, grow one of the uh, older types like uh, uh, deer tongue or, or some of those or any of the newer super red ones because the red pigment tends to uh, allow slightly less uh, air, uh, sun to come in and, and blouse them up. And those red ones are so beautiful. They are. They I've been having them on salads and sandwiches for the last several weeks, but I cut them back and then try to regrow them from some of the sprouts. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I just finished with my spring spinach salads. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it was And that's great. Really and and we, I, I only had six cauliflowers, but they all came pretty well and I had my first cauliflower last weekend. And what wonderful. did you do to get the cauliflower to do so well? I bought a, a started transplant okay. uh, and just put it in the garden and, and hope for the best. It's starting to get too hot for them, uh, but uh, they made pretty nice heads. And, and, and do you I, blanch and, them? Oh, absolutely. In that's spring, what I was... In, in, oh, in the spring you have to, yeah, you have to tie up the leaves because the, the, because the sun is directly overhead, sh shines right down on them and, and it discolors them and makes them kind of nasty. Yeah. Uh, in the fall, uh, there are very upright leaf cauliflowers that you can plant so that you, you can maybe get by because by then the, the angle is down to where it doesn't shine in on them quite as badly. But if you're in doubt, tie the, tie the leaves together and, and keep them nice and white and beautiful. Yes, that was what I was trying to get you to say, yep, so yep. I should have just asked. I'll have purple and, 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 and yellow ones for the fall. So. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <coughs> we like chatting about vegetable gardens on the show. All right, <coughs> now. In the middle, Sandy Mason. Yes, uh, I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm a horticulture educator, and I pretty much anything green and growing, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff, so I'll, try, I'll do my best to help you out. Um, I'm also a, um, I, I'd like to say reformed plant nerd, but I'm really not, because I'll never reform to be no. a plant nerd. I love <laughs> different types of plants, and this is like my new favorite, my new <laughs> all-time favorite. Uh, this is actually called Cape Star Frizzle Sizzle. Like, what a great name. This 
this is not fake. Chuck said some people are going to think this plant's fake. Uh, this is not fake. This is Albuca spiralis. So what a, what a great name, huh? It actually comes from South Africa. And uh, it, I got that this year. I love it. It has this wonderful bulb. Uh, supposedly it does have a flower in the springtime, but it is not being from South Africa. It is not hardy. Zone 10. So even, you know, 30 degrees temperatures, it will it will uh, barely survive. So this is one of those plants that you'd have to grow in as a, as a house plant. And it. What but is, what fun. What is the genus name? It's Albuca spiralis. A but what a, what a great name. A-L-B-U-C-A. -B -B Albuca spiralis. Albuca. Okay. And it's actually related to like Star Bethlehem. I kind of did a little bit more res research on it. So we'd say it is one of those plants that's just a really different and fun. And, and how cool is this? That's funky. I mean, yeah, if you didn't you know better, this? you'd swear somebody abused it with a curling iron. Yeah, it's or something that like that. It was plastic. Yeah. I, I wish I had a <laughs> head. That. I wish I had a head planter. That's my next thing. Oh you get a head goodness. planter and have this coming out of the head. Oh. Really cool. And that's what gardening is all about, isn't it? Have fun. Just have some fun with it. Oh, yeah. That'll get some that's attention. That's fun. Right there. Thank you, Sandy. That mm -hmm. is funky and nerdy all at the same time. <laughs> okay, let's go to you, Mark Kemp. Okay, yes, my name is Mark Kemp, and I am a landscape architect, and I can ask any ask help with any questions on design, perennials, shrubs, trees. Um, brought in a show and tell. Um, it's in my front yard garden. Um, it's a little bit debatable in terms of a perennial. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, it needs to be in the right situation, though, because it can spread. And we think that the, the things that might lead to that would be excess moisture. Um, in, this, in my yard, it's, it's kept in check with mowing and um, uh, sugar maple nearby. Um, but what I like about it is the flower. Um, it's gooseneck loose, loose strife. Um, gooseneck, obviously, um, because of the, 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 the crook in the flower, uh, blooms for a very, very long time, a uh, month and a half easily. Um, and it just, it, it, like at night, it will actually glow. I mean, the white flower, and I think white is often forgotten about in a lot of beds. White can transition between other perennials. I have a daylily that's next to it that holds its own, uh, keeps it from spreading also. Mm -hmm. um, it's Lysimachia is, um, is its uh, Latin name. Um, but all around, yes, you need to keep it in check. It spreads by rhizomes. So if it's spreading too far, uh, be aggressive and pull it back. It won't mind at all. So um, it's a flower that uh, I like to like to have around, and it's pretty pretty solid. Is there a lightning bug on it? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Oh. So it's a just freshly dug out of the yard. It's really nice for critters, but yeah, you butterflies tracks butterflies. Mm -hmm. Also a golden yellow fall color, um, sometimes orangish. Uh, so it has two two purposes. But um, I keep mine in check by mowing and by a path on the other side, so it can't go anywhere, Yes, but it would. So, okay, this is fun seeing all these show and tales and hearing about the vegetable garden. Well, let's go to our Did You Know segment next. Tomatoes were once considered poisonous in Europe because the wealthy would eat them on plates high in lead content, leading to lead poisoning. Didn't quite figure, there was a disconnect between <laughs> the plate and what was, okay. Well, let's move on to the phone lines and we're gonna go to Peggy's question on line two and it's about uh, something about iris seed pods. Hi, Peggy. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're uh, welcome. I have some irises and they've got great big blooms on, but anyhow, I have three seed pods on there and I wanna know when it's right to take those off of there to be able to re reseed them or whatever. So you want to start new irises from the seeds? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you really just let them ripen. I never tried it with irises, but you, with most of them, you just let them ripen naturally. So once they turn brown, I would think by now they probably are. I think they start to split open when they're yeah. when they're full so mature. So you would know. Kind of like a daylily pod. When they're ready. So yeah, I just trimmed back some that were green. Mm -hmm. They were totally green, so those oh, really? weren't ready. Okay. So just look for the color, and then try it out. And I, the seeds I like should be black when they're ready, shouldn't yeah. they? Yes, seeds are black, and uh, when they're decorative, they'll open up, and you can you know, actually take the seeds out and still have the decorative pod. Mm -hmm. She, it, she might want to look and see if they need a stratification or something to mm -hmm. to germinate, or even scarification. I don't know. Yeah, they might need some sort of a treatment, either either, cold either a cold moist treatment filing. for a while, and or something that breaks the seed coat. I don't know how tough it is. 
Okay. But it's probably a pretty good rule of thumb just to, for people just to keep in mind is that generally if you really want to collect the seeds, you need to let them ripen on the plant. So that's yes. probably a pretty good rule of thumb for most plants. You just don't take them off too early. Don't be in the mad right. deadheader unless you, unless you just don't want <laughs> the seeds. So. Well, and just generally, if you don't want the seeds, it's probably better to take them off so that the plant doesn't waste a lot right. of energy growing right. them. Right. That's but, why I was cutting but, those but, other ones back. But it, yeah, but it's... You know, it can be fun to try to start some weird things and, and impress your friends, mm -hmm. but <laughs> if, if, if you don't weird things. if you don't want the seeds, then it's it's better to cut them off right. rather than let them develop. Okay, well, thank you for your question, and let's go to Elizabeth's question on line three, and it's about raspberries. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello, I have blackberry plants. Oh, oh blackberries. Say, yeah, thank you for your program. It's very helpful. I have blackberries that won't ripen. And I just need to know if I need to dig them up, throw them away, or it, are they too close to the red raspberries, or is it a mite, or what? So they just never ripen, as in they. Well, they're right now they're red and they're hard, very very mm -hmm. hard. They've well, been that way for a month. Hmm. Well, it's not. I mean, they'll still continue. Have did they do it last year, or are you just basing it on right now? Because won't they go ahead and continue to ripen? If well, they've been red for a month, they it doesn't be seem... red for a month, but... Yeah, usually they go green, red, black relatively fast. Okay. <clears throat> uh, is the foliage look all right? I touched them, and they're very hard. <laughs> is the yeah, foliage yeah. okay? Does the f What does the foliage look like? Normal? Yes. Okay, because sometimes yeah. they, they can get rust and some things that would that would kind of disrupt the whole process. But, um, boy, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, because usually with if it's a disease <coughs> issue, they don't go ahead and necessarily s just stay red. You know, they might turn brown or black or something like that, but just to stay red, but then never go ahead and fully form um, to the point where yeah. they ripen. It's definitely not yeah. not anything to do with the red raspberries unless, yeah. no. unless no. it's a question of disease transmission. Um, there's no no issue of, the red raspberries making them stay red. I wonder which <coughs> kind it is, because that would be worth to just get rid of all of those and start with a new, yeah, a new type. One of Bob's. A thornless blackberry <laughs> type. Wouldn't be too much of a loss in terms of time. Yeah, because you, you know, yeah. they're easy to so, get started. So, do you think that warm? You know, we had a fairly warm April, cool May. I mean, do you think there's something going on with just? too hot in April or something along those lines, or too dry? Seems or like that would have been too early for yeah. it to start, I don't know. So I'm almost thinking it's a, either environmental or there's something else going on there, because you would think with disease issue, we might see it on the leaves, mm -hmm. or you might see something else going on there, so I'm not sure. Right, and if it had been super hot and super dry yeah. that whole you'd time, expect that. you'd expect them maybe to right. be a little dry and right. hard, but right. if they've been red for like weeks, yeah. that doesn't that's not yeah. a normal thing. Okay, so we're a bit stumped, <laughs> but and I would I start I mean, over. as you asked about the plant, if it was a root system that was being, you know, eaten on or shortened, um, you would think the rest of the plant would respond yeah. the it's same way. It would be stunting yeah. or something like that. Okay, well, we're going to move along because we're not exactly <coughs> sure, but I would try a new one somewhere else for the upcoming year. All right, let's go to Paula's question about garlic, and this is on line four. Hi, Paula. Hi. Uh, we planted garlic for the first time last fall, and it's almost ready, and I'm not sure how we're going to store it. You've got the perfect guy the on perfect the panel. perfect guy. We had garlic okay. guy over here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, depending on what the variety is, uh, most years around the 4th of July, uh, they're going to they're gonna be about ready. I usually gauge it by how many green leaves are, are left. Uh, you want to dig it when there's at least three green leaves still on it because otherwise the dampness in the soil will start to rot off the papery wrappers that we want to have around the bulbs. When that happens, uh, dig one up, make sure that, that, that they've divided into cloves because that's the other indicator. Uh, they're, they're all solid and then as they start to mature they divide into the cloves. Um, so you want good clove development and, and a few green leaves. Dig them. Get them out of uh, light, put them in a dark, airy place, uh, as moderate a temperature as you can find. Uh, an old corn crib driveway worked well for me, and unfortunately not too many people have old corn crib driveways. Um, 
and I let them dry like that for three or four weeks until everything is brown and crisp and nice and dry. Um, at that point, you can uh, cut off the tops, cut off the roots if you want to. Uh, you want to leave the roots on them after you, after you dig them because it helps wick moisture away from the bulb as it's drying. You get them thoroughly dried at that point. Uh, the, their individual flavor will have developed really well then. And then you want to store them at a cool but not cold temperature. So uh, 60 degrees would be fairly ideal, but if you have an air-conditioned kitchen uh, away from the stove in a, in a pot or something where they, they can breathe, uh, do not put them in the refrigerator. Uh, inside the, the clove skins, they will mold. And will also think that maybe they ought to grow and neither of those are good things. So keep them at moderate temperature in the dark. And depending on the variety, some of them will only store about four months. Uh, some of the soft necks might store up to 12 months. So. Wow, okay. That was a good question, good timing. All right, let's go on and we're gonna see Carol about Carolyn's question on line five. <laughs> and it looks like it's about bees and compost. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, um, I have a swarm of bumblebees that have taken up residence in my compost pile. And I wonder if anybody has any suggestions how to get rid of them. I, I would say congratulations and don't get rid of yeah. them. I, you know, bumblebee, I don't think people realize, you know, we hear about honeybees in decline, but bumblebees are really have a big issue with um, surviving now. So I would say congratulations. I realize you probably want to use the compost, but I would, if there's any way, just let them have it for now. They're not gonna, you know, soon they're gonna be through with their colony, they'll leave. Um, I would almost bet maybe the compost pile might have been a little extra dry, maybe you had bigger sticks or something like in there that made it really a good spot for them. Because typically I haven't seen bumblebees in a compost pile, probably more in like a, where you might have debris pile kind yeah. of thing. So you might think about how you manage the pile and make sure it's not too dry, but I would say just just enjoy them for right now to be honest with you because they really are they need your help and oh my goodness I would I would again I'd say congratulations that you have bumblebees you know and they're not gonna they're really not unless you grab them or you know something like that they're not gonna sting you they're not gonna you know you really have to be pretty aggressive with them before they're gonna be aggressive with you so if there's any way you can just sort of let them go for now uh, soon, I don't know how quickly, but I would say, say in the next month or so, they'll probably end up um, uh, being finished with the with that particular colony and move on. So, um, is my guess. So, if you can, leave them, <laughs> enjoy. Just leave it there and maybe they have need a, your help. They need our help. They people really do. pay money to to get in, bumblebee to introduce colonies. them in, in the greenhouse yeah. to pollinate things. Yeah, and actually, people yeah. don't realize just how important bumblebees are when it comes to pollination. Yeah. We always hear about honeybees and the concern over bees, um, but our native bumblers really need some. They they need our help, and they're also we're also seeing decline in bumblebees. Yeah, there's there's some of the clovers that that like honeybees can't pollinate, and bumblebees have the ability to like yeah. tear out the flower and get at the. They're really the, strong. Yeah, they can pull <coughs> apart those big like pea flowers and some of those yeah. that a lot of the other bees wow. just can't. I have too. so many bumblebees. And, I didn't yeah. know. I mean, love, now, see, I love bumblebees. I don't mind I like watching right. them. I think it's neat that so, aerodynamically, fine. if you do the analysis, oh, yeah. they, they can't fly. fly. Yeah. They can't fly. They and yet they fly. do. do. <coughs> and it's determined. They don't lose control of the compost yeah, pile yeah. either. It, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. So. And it's, it's not that the, every single year they're going to come back or they're going to be there forever. So I think you just have to wait it out a little bit and then really think about managing your pile later and maybe having it make sure that it, it's a, okay. maybe a little bit more moist and maybe, maybe actually shredding things more. Okay, very good. And it uh, looks like we have a Blackberry comment. We're going to go to line six and see what EJ has for us. Hi, line six. Hi. Uh, Bernal's blackberries, Bob's, I've had them for years, and where I have them is semi-shade. So part of the pro, they do not, um, they do not uh, ripen at the same rate that it would if it was in full sun. Mm -hmm. Because I have friends who have ripened berries right now, they're in full sun, but mine are at the green stage. They will go to the red stage. I've had these for years, and they really are good producers. So I think your questions are right. As long as the foliage is okay, 
uh, you're okay. Just be patient, and especially if you if you've got shade around. But mine, mine are doing great. I love your show. Most of you gardeners, in fact, Sandy, I remember you from 30 years ago. Kidding. <laughs> when I was just, she stuff. was only three at her baptism. <laughs> <laughs> when I was just a child. <laughs> well, that's good. It's one of my favorite comments. Oh, that's funny for gardeners <clears throat> is to just be patient, and so that's really well, thank you. that's really good. So, anyway, thank you. That was a fun comment. Well, let's go back to our panelists and see what you've got on email. Chuck, we'll start okay. with you. Okay, I have a pumpkin question. All right. And the question is, we have several mounds of pumpkins, I would probably call them hills, <laughs> and they are all like this. Can you tell me what it is? And we have a couple of pictures, and, and there's a whitish or silvery uh, coloration on the upper surface of the leaves. Um, from what I've been able to tell from that, uh, that looks to me to be just a, a natural coloration that some of the some of the pumpkins and squash have on the leaves. Uh, with the hybrid pumpkins, I don't think I see it as nearly as much as I used to when there were more open pollinated things. But chances are very good that that's just the genetic way the leaves on that particular pumpkin are supposed to look. Uh, when I first looked at at one of the pictures, which was a little blurry on this on this sheet. I said, wow, it's, it's, it's too early for powdery mildew. Uh, that happens in the dog days of late summer when it's very humid and we don't get rain because that's the, the irony of powdery mildew is it loves high humidity. We can't stand free water. So if you get water on the leaves, it, does a, it louses up the cycle because they have to have 72 hours to sprout and infect. Um, so <clears throat> if it is powdery mildew, which I don't think this is, but uh, there are powdery mildew resistant uh, jack o' lantern pumpkin varieties now, and when you shop for your seed, you could look for one of those. Uh, but this is just a unique coloration uh, that, like I say, I used to, when I used to do big variety trial blocks, uh, occasionally one or two of them would show up looking like this, and that's just, uh, just the way it is. Just, just their natural, natural way. It's, Okay. You know, some of us are blonde and some of us are not bald. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> and now Sandy. Okay. Uh, Tom Greenan from Chicago, I think, has a question we can all relate to at one time or another. How do I get rid of those pesky fruit flies in my kitchen? I tried apple cider vinegar, a little dish detergent, but they're surround, recently around. Uh, he bought a taro fruit fly trap. It seems to be working all right, but there's the last two weeks or so be some lingering. How uh, you get rid of them once and for all? So I think we've all had fruit flies there one time or another so obviously the big thing is find out where they're coming from and you know take care of that whatever you might have bananas whatever it might be um, make sure you get rid of that and I also I would say if you had like bananas like sitting in a bowl or something make sure you always like scrub out the bowl and around the bowl because the little pupa of these guys are actually is very sticky um, so you really have to like scrub it out a little bit and get rid of that so make sure you've done that uh, certainly uh, commercial fly traps as they found out will certainly work can work um, you can actually make your own with just using like a long neck bottle and uh, a certain entomologist the University of Illinois Extension entomologist who shall remain nameless uh, mentioned the idea that you could just use a wine bottle leave a little bit of wine in it um, put the wine bottle on its side and the fruit flies will actually be attracted to the wine that's left in the wine bottle but they can't get out of the wine bottle uh, out of the long necked bottle when you lay it on its side like that they're not smart enough to figure that out mm -hmm. um, so if you so they are so you can do things like that where you actually kind of make your own traps and get rid of them and it takes a while uh, and also make sure that you don't have fungus gnats because that's the other thing because fungus gnats will actually come out of soil that's kept too wet like in your house plants and stuff so make sure you're not also having that kind of an issue because sometimes people think those are fruit flies so it is one of those okay. things you kind of have to wait them out but eventually you'll get rid of them all right well, we're going to go to you, Mark. Do you have a okay. quick question yes. and answer? Um, the question is, since when do lilacs like slightly acid soil? Um, this comes from Allison. Um, I understand this kind of comes from several weeks ago where somebody said put um, pine needles around because the... Someone asked if they could. Yes, if they could. Mm -hmm. And it kind of put them in a category where they would be acid loving. Now, the truth be told, it's probably that lilacs are so forgiving that they like a neutral soil or slightly... Uh, uh, acidic, um, so they're just forgiving. So you could go 6.5 to 7 is their target, but 5.5 to 7.5. 
um, they're going to be pretty forgiving. Um, so it's not that they like or love acid soil, it's that they, they're comfortable in slightly acid soil. And as my soil scientist colleagues always say, the soils in the Midwest are very highly buffered. It takes a lot for them to change. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that's why you see those giant truckloads of lime going out onto the fields <laughs> to try right. to moderate because things. Because it, it's more likely <coughs> to stay the same than it is to change drastically. So if you have blueberries, you have to work hard to yeah. get those acidic. So slightly acidic is slightly actually a acidic good thing. Is, yeah. So most things like it slightly acidic, which could be 6.9. <laughs> you know, it's just yes. barely acidic. <laughs> so, but anyway, thank you for um, responding on Facebook to a question. Uh, it's sometimes hard to cover everything in great detail. Thank you, Mark, for answering that. Well, boy, it does go very fast, doesn't it? We had lots of fun questions, and we like when you ask us really fun questions like some of these in our area of expertise. We hope that you have a great week gardening. Get out there and have lots of fun. See you next time. Bye-bye.